action, purpose as a result of this word. We are, our hearts are good soil. Your word is good seed. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, y'all ready? You sure? All right. <laughs> you said you was ready, so hey, we going to see. I, I thought it was going to be uh, an easy word, but then, of course, 20 minutes before service start, what does God do? Gives me more. And I'm just writing, 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 writing. They came in. I didn't even hear nobody come in the office. It was, it was, it was good. And I, I did this lesson uh, Friday. Yeah, I, I work ahead of time because I don't, I don't like rushing. But, you know, he, he does what he does in his time. So I just, you know, thank God for that. But last week we talked about what? What did we talk about last week? Gifts. gifts our spiritual gifts. And our spiritual gifts come from where? Right? Thank, Dr. J be listening, y'all. I feel some type of way about that. <laughs> she said the Holy Spirit. You are correct. Let's give it up for Dr. J. Because she did that. Anyway, so, so how many of you guys have been praying about your spiritual gifts? Y'all been praying about them? As you should, okay? <laughs> uh, I am going to eventually post um, a purpose questionnaire. We have a spiritual gift survey, right? But it's very, very long. And I understand that. So as the purpose coach that I am, I actually came up with a smaller questionnaire. It's still not small, small, because you have to ask enough questions to get a really good comprehensive answer. Okay, so, but it is shorter than the one that we've done traditionally. Uh, as soon as I finish, I just got some small touches I want to put on it. Uh, and then we'll post that on our website so that you can take uh, the, the survey, the questionnaire, and you'll be able to see what your dominant spiritual gifts are. It'll give you some type of guidance as to what you have. Let me be clear about this. If you've done it before, great. Know this, that spiritual gifts change as you grow spiritually. Pastor was not on my list when I first took this. Okay? Uh, but then it did come on there. I think it was like the third time I did it. And it went on there, and I was like, uh-uh, mm-mm, nope. But the fact of the matter is, I was operating in those spiritual gifts with or without a title. So, uh, and, and so we just need, just be open to doing it again because, you know, spiritual gifts, they grow. And some things that weren't as dominant before, as you grew spiritually, it becomes more dominant now, you understand what I'm saying? So everyone be open to that question. It's going to be good. Uh, but my whole ultimate goal is for you guys to uh, know who you are, know who God made you to be so that you can walk in it. I'm sorry, I made it too close. All right, so we're going to uh, talk today. See, last week I was trying to talk about gifts and talents, but that's, that, that didn't work. So this week we're going to talk about talents, okay? And talents are different than gifts. Spiritual gifts are given to us by the Holy Spirit. Talents are a natural, as a natural ability to do something or to do something well. It's a natural ability. It's already in you. You already have it. Okay, you don't have to work to have this ability. You already have the ability. Uh, I want to discuss, because uh, I like to give you a visual, animals with talents, because I feel like that's good. Animals with talents are really cool because, okay, that's talent, agreed, but that's not, that's not exactly the talent I was going for, I, that's cute, but no, that's, that's not, that's not a natural ability, they taught him how to skateboard, okay, so that's not a, he's talented, but that wasn't his talent, I want to, <laughs> cute, but I want to talk about animals uh, that naturally have some abilities, okay? So let's start uh, with the dolphin. Dolphins are cool because they use these little high-pitched noise, you know, in, in the water, and the reason why they do it is because they use those sounds in the water to bounce off of things so that one, they know where they are, they know uh, what's around them, they know when they're hunting, 
what's around them. They can talk to each other with these cliques. It's a natural ability. They didn't go to school to learn how to do this. It was a natural ability that they were born with. You get that? Um, axolotl. It's a weird name for a weird animal. Him weird, right? But him can be a Marvel he hero. Because him can have his arm bitten off and he can grow a whole new arm with all the muscles, all the nerves, all the blood vessels, all of them just re he can regenerate. That's pretty, yeah, so you can talk about him all you want. You can say he ugly all you want, but I bet you if somebody bites your arm off, you not growing a new one. Talk about him if you want to. The sea cucumber is not what you put in salad. I wouldn't put that in my salad. Sea cucumbers are interesting because they can liquefy themselves. They can go from solid to liquid. So if something's coming to eat him and he's near a crack that he can't get into in his solid form, he can make himself liquid, slide into that crack, and then become solid again so he can stay in there. That's natural. He didn't, he didn't learn that. That's what came in him. Last one is our favorite, the cockroach. Look at y'all. Hey, the cockroach. The cockroach has been known. Everybody talk about when the world ends, the cockroach still going to be here. Him not going nowhere. Here's why. A cockroach can live for weeks without his head. That's why they're so hard to kill. Cockroaches don't, don't do things like we do. First of all, they breathe through holes in their body. Second of all, you know how we have blood vessels and veins where our blood goes through? Their blood just flows all over their body, just however it feels like. Okay? And their major organs are not in their head. So when you chop their head off, they still running around. That's why they're so hard to kill. Now, why did God make them so heartily? I still don't know. But there is a purpose for a roach. We just haven't figured out what it is yet. But if you notice, God gave all of these animals special abil abilities for survival. You can take the roach off the screen. I don't want to. They're good on roaches. We have talents that help us maneuver in the world as well. Our talents, we're born with them so that us specifically, wherever we are, whatever environments that God puts us in, we are able to survive in those areas with our talents. And so we're going to talk about what these talents are, what they do. And, and a talent is something that you're naturally good at, and it's not a lot of effort for you to do it. It's not a lot of effort. There are some things that some people can do that another person, they would have to work really hard at doing it. For example, if somebody was, is just really good with numbers, just really good, they can just do something in their head real quick. I can do it, but I don't think I can do it as well as some other people can do it. I can do some stuff in my head, but some people, I'll be like, how, Sway, how? Ooh, like uh, Ivan's son. Wow. Ivan, little Ivan is amazing with numbers, okay? And I am thoroughly impressed because he's young, but he's really good at it. I'm curious as to what that gift is going to be used for, that talent is going to be used for, you know, because he's naturally good at it, no effort. And he was doing, wasn't he doing a Rubik's Cube at the same? Come on, Sway, I've never to, my, to this day ever solved a Rubik's Cube. My man was literally Rubik's Cubing and doing math problems in his head. That's an ability, a natural ability. He's smart, smart, for a reason. I have a natural ability, and you can put, pick, put up this next crypt, uh, picture of me. I have a natural ability to coach people. It is a natural ability. This is me with my team. They look like a little ragtag team of girls, right? But here's the deal with me. I can take anybody and make them a basketball player. If they wanted to do it, I can make them a basketball player. And y'all like, yeah, okay, whatever. No, seriously. I never had, I don't think till the end of my coaching tenure did I have actual good players. 
I never really had amazing players, but I was always able to make amazing players. Now, here's the funny thing. You want to hear the funny thing? Funny thing, I never played in high school. I never played in middle school. I never played in college. I never played professionally. Technically, I'm not supposed to be able to coach no basketball team. And parents was looking at me like, come on now. Really? But I had the natural ability to analyze the game, see what's happening, see what different players were good at, and exploit whatever they were good at, and put them in the places that they needed to be for us to be successful. And I was able to make them feel like they could. I had cheerleaders quit cheerleading to be basketball players because we looked like we were having more fun. They didn't know it was hard work. <laughs> but they stayed because they saw we were successful. I've had undefeated seasons. We won city championship with six, six people on the team. Six girls on the team and five of them had never played before. I had to tell you, he was there. And we were playing an undefeated team. With a, team, with a player that ranked like nationwide, like she was good, good. We weren't supposed to win that game. But God is good. Right? I ain't going to take all that credit. Please. Ain't no way. But I say all that to say it was a natural ability to do it. There are other things that I'm naturally able to do. All right? But that's just one of them. So my question is, do you have something that you are naturally able to do without much effort? Now, I want to get into Matthew chapter 25. I didn't forget about the Bible. Come on, y'all, relax. <laughs> she ain't going to use no word today. Relax. New King James Version. This is the story of the talents. I'm not going to read all of it. It starts at verse 14, Matthew 25 and 14. I'm not going to read all of it. I'm going to paraphrase it, okay, because it's a lot. But read it. I'm, I want you to read it, okay, so that you know it. Uh, so Jesus was talking, and he said, For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. Go ahead to 15. He's, and to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Stop there. First of all, talents. In Bible times, I research, there's a lot of discussion of what it could be worth. Some say it's $1,000. Some say it's $30,000. Some say over $100,000. The majority of the people say it's upwards of $30,000 for one talent. It was a piece of monetary uh, use. So... One got five of those, so about 150 G's. One got two, so about 60 G's. And one got one, which was about 30 G's. So the master gave each of them a talent according to their own ability. This is not to say that one ability was better than the other. It was just that they all had different abilities. And so the master knew, I can't give the one with one five because he's not able to handle five yet. Let me give him this one. The one with five, he said, he needs this much because I know he's going to do some stuff with this. This was his own money. Go back to 14. Is that where he said it out of his own money? Yes, he delivered his goods. To Can you switch to the message version on 14? Is that possible? I'll give you a little time. I know I'm asking a lot. Uh, but in 14, I'll be all over the place on this, these verses because he dumped on me like real quick. And so <laughs> I'm going to try to spit it out the best way I can. Uh, his service together and delegated responsibilities. Nah, that wasn't that version. Oh, well. Uh, but anyway, so he, the master gave, what I'm trying to sum up is the master gave out of his money. This wasn't their money. He invested in them. This was an investment. Now notice, in these scriptures, no matter what version you look at, he never told them what to do with them. He just gave them to them. Okay? And left. Well, no, excuse me. Uh, so, what, so what did you want me to do 
with the five? Is this, is this something you wanted me to do with it? He didn't do none of that. Now, I would venture to say, because see, servants don't get money from their masters. If a servant gets any favorable uh, treatment from a master, that means that these servants are closer than just servants. If you think about the story of, uh, let's see, the Roman soldier whose servant was sick and he came to Jesus and asked Jesus to heal his servant. He not just coming so that the servant can work again. He truly cared about the servant. Because if he didn't care, he could have just died, let him do, die and just get another one. So clearly he had a tighter relationship with the servant. So for him to give that much money to servants, he had to have had a nice relationship with them, yeah? He had to have trusted them a little bit, right, to give that much money to, right? And so I venture to say that with all that, he invested in who he knew them to be. He knew them well enough to say what they could handle. God knows us well enough that the talents that we have, he knows we can handle them. I'm going somewhere. It's going to be uncomfortable for some of you, but I'm going somewhere. And so my question is, like, what would you do with that much? If you had that much money, if somebody gave you that much money, what would you do? Some of you are like, I pay off my bills. Uh, I get out of debt. I get me a car. Right? Well, let's look at what they did. So the, uh, it don't matter what version you're in. I really don't care. Okay, New Living Translation is fine with me. Move on. Uh, let's go to 16 then. In that version, it's fine. There you go. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earn five more. Okay, next one. The servant with two bags of silver also went to work and earned two more. Next one. But the servant who received the one bag of silver dug a hole in the ground and hid he the master's money. We'll stop there, because you know I got to. The first two were excited about what they got and put it to work immediately. It says that the first one with five invested. It says the second one with two put it to work. Two different things. Because remember, their abilities are different. And then that third one, put it in the ground. Like if nothing else, when he come back, he going to have his money back. He won't be able to say that I lost his money. I kept it there and I hid it. Did nobody steal it from me? I ain't wasted on no drinks. I ain't wasted on no girls. I ain't wasted on no material things. I made sure that he had what he had. Now... The master came back, and when he came back, he asked them to tell him what they did with his money. First one is excited. Master, you gave me five, I got five more. Ten, ten, bro, ten. Watch me. You see what I did? Watch me. And the master was like, well done, good and faithful servant. Because you got this, I'm going to give you some more. Because you did, because you invested and did what you could with this, I'm going to give you some more. There you go. Second one was like, yo, got you two more off of them. Got four. Genius, right? Master was like, genius. Well done, good and faithful servant. Because you were faithful over that, I'm going to give you more. Then that last one comes. Let's go to that one, the last one. Yep, 24. I knew you were a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here's your money back. Crazy, right? Crazy. Let me look, it's a better one. Uh -huh. Go to uh, New King James Version of, of uh, 24. New King James Version. Give him a second. They'll get there. And, and he said, uh, 
Then who, he who received one talent uh, said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. So he was telling his master, low key, giving him all the shade in the world. It was a backhanded type thing. Like, I knew you wasn't, you didn't have integrity. I knew you to be a person. I knew you to be a person that was hard. I knew you to be a person that didn't take from where you did stuff at. You took from other places that wasn't yours. And so because you did stuff in places that wasn't yours, I didn't want to increase you. I didn't want you to get more than you deserved. Isn't that wild? That's basically what he said. You didn't deserve me to increase your stuff. Because I knew you to be a hard man. Now, here's my thing. Number one, if he was such a hard man, why did he give you any money to begin with? If he was such a hard man, why didn't the other two do what you did? See how quiet y'all got? Because I want you to think. Why were they so eager to give increase and he wasn't? It never said that they were scared of being hurt, so they hurried up and put it to work. It never said that. They just went straight to it. So evidently, the first two had a different relationship with the master than the last one. The first two knew the master a different way than the last one did. How many of you God has given a talent to, but you only know him to be a hard God, a punisher of sin? Not a giver of wealth, but when I'm wrong, I'm going to hell. Do you only know him as someone that sends someone to hell? How do you view God? Because however you view God, that tells you what you're going to do with what he gave you. Who is he to you? I'm checking your thinking. Do you think God is going to give you something that you can't do anything with? Do you think God is someone that's going to set you up for failure? That was something God had to minister to me about for years. Most of my life, I didn't look at God as a giver and a lover. I knew he was one, but for me, the majority of the time, I just looked at him as one that kept track of all the wrong I did and made sure I did what I was supposed to do. But he wasn't one that really took care of me. See, I'm talking about me so you don't feel guilty. And so, because of that, I didn't really use everything he gave me to his fullest ability because I was like, if I get this wrong, he's going to be upset. If I mess up. Now, that was the thing. I used to rap. Some of y'all don't know that. Some of y'all do. I'm not going to rap right now, so get over yourself. So here's the deal. I was a Christian rapper. I was really good at writing lyrics. I was really good at flipping other people's beats because back then I didn't have no producer. So I would take the secular music and they had instrumentals back in the day. Those of y'all, I'm dating myself, but it's okay. Back in the day, you know, you had them singles where it had the full version and then you had the instrumental. You know what I'm saying? As a part of that, you know, and so you would listen to the instrumental. If it didn't have no chorus or no hook on it, you could use that bad boy for whatever you wanted to use it for. And so I would use other people's hooks and I would create songs. I would write songs. I was good at it. I was even good at it to where I would write songs for singers. See, look at y'all. I was like, for real? Yeah, I was that girl. And so we were into contests, Christian contests, you know, and we would just wipe, we would just take all the trophies. I would just enter each person into a different category so we could just take all of them. I remember we opened up, who did we, was it Kim Stratton? I think it was Kim Stratton. I think it was her at Westside. And me and my singers, we did, uh, we flipped the Brandy and Monica song, The Boy Is Mine. We flipped that bad boy. 
and I, I rocked it. You know what I'm saying? I killed that stage. You can tell me nothing. I know I killed it. I killed that bad boy. Everybody was like, oh, my God. They was all hyped about it. Because at the time, nobody really heard anybody do anything like that before. Okay? And so uh, she was late. And so they was feeling some type of way, and the newspaper was there. So the newspaper article comes out to talk about the event, and, and, and they talk about me more than her. Favor. I, wasn't even, I didn't even know nobody from the newspaper was there. So I was Gary famous for a minute. <laughs> no, you can see, you got, side note, you got a lot of people with talent in Gary that think they famous, but they only famous in Gary. Don't nobody know them nobody. out of Gary, but you can't tell them. They walk around stank because they Gary famous. <laughs> they tour the storefronts. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with that, but stop thinking highly of yourself. That's just a side note. But anyway, so I was Gary famous. I wasn't famous famous. I was Gary famous. Now, I did do some touring. You know, I met Kent Jones. I, I met Ty Tribbett before he was Ty Tribbett. You know, I met a lot of artists before they were the artists, okay? So I had this talent, and somehow I allowed the devil to get into me and make me afraid of messing up on stage. Now, it wasn't a thought at first. When I first started doing it, you couldn't tell me nothing. If I messed up, I was like, oh, well, and I would keep going. No matter how terrible it sounded, I would just keep going. And some point, and I think it was right at the point where I was about to do something big, that I allowed him to tell me, you can't get up and, and keep messing up like that. Stop getting up there if you don't know what you're doing. And so I stopped. My album didn't go nowhere. I had a nice album. I didn't really like it, but everybody else did. Amen. And so, you know, I had done, you know, PR where I was interviewing at radio, you know, a radio host and all of that, and they all had these shows, and they was like, as soon as you get done shooting your video, shoot it to us, we're going to put it out there. I had the capability of being that person, but I allowed to stop my talent. I allowed, I buried my talent. Because I knew God to be a hard man, and he didn't want me to get up there and mess up. He never said nothing to me. He never beat me up when I messed up. And to be very honest, a lot of people didn't beat me up if I messed up a lyric. And so I put it down for years. I tried to pick it back up, and it was okay, but it just wasn't the same. Well, at the end of this, that last one, if we go to that, he said he hid it, and the master called him a wicked and lazy servant. You wicked and lazy servant. You knew all that about me, huh? You knew that I, I reap where I had sown. You, you knew that I gathered where I had not scattered seed. Okay, cool. Keep going. Uh, so you at least should have put my money in a savings account. And at least I could have got some interest on my own money. Next one. Therefore, take that talent from him and give it to the dude with 10. Keep going. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. I can tell you right now, if I wanted to write some lyrics right now, it would not be as easy as it used to be. I literally could write a song in about 20 minutes, a good one. I cannot say that I can do that now. I lost that talent. Now I could possibly pick it back up, and with some work I could probably cultivate it, but it's not, it's not as easy as it was. Some of y'all had some talents. That if you try to do it now, you probably can't do it as easy as you did before because you put it down. You hid it. Let's talk about why we hide these things. Well, we hide it because... You know, somebody told us it wasn't good. We let an outside person tell us we weren't good. We let an outside person tell us we couldn't do it. I think the beginning of those thoughts of me messing up was I rapped at a school one time, which was unheard of to do Christian rap at a school. 
rocked that one. The whole gym went crazy. They had a like sock hop and they, they went crazy over a Christian song, right? And when I get out, this older dude comes out and he was like, yeah, you're pretty good, but you know, you ain't gonna be able to just get it easy like that. Why did he hate on me? What was that all about? He had no reason. But he did. And guess what? I let him. And I took that little comment and I put it in my pocket and I kept it. How many of y'all have kept some comments in your pocket? You've let someone stop your talent. Some of y'all, it ain't someone on the outside that told you that you couldn't. Your insides told you you couldn't. Your insides said you don't look good enough to be in pictures. Your insides told you that your singing ain't as good as you think it is. Your insides told you that you're not as organized as you think you are. See, that, pl- that one little thing is out of place. That's where that OCD stuff come from. Your best ain't enough. So you up forever spending your life trying to make it better when it was fine just the way it was. That's, that's, that, that's that spirit. This is good, but not good enough. It's never good enough. That's for somebody that's dealing with that. Bind that. You're good enough. What you have is good enough. And here's why it's good enough. It's not good enough because of you. It's good enough because of the Christ in you. So, yeah, you're right. You might not be good enough personally, but the Christ in you is, so you good. You will always be good. So, what have you done with your talents? Now, let's talk about the hiding of them. Let me see where we at. I talked about all that. Good, I did good. Matthew 5 and 14 through 16, New King James Version. Matthew 5, 14 through 16. We know this scripture. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Keep going. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Keep going. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We were not made to be hidden. We were not made to be in the background. Some of you guys are comfortable with not being seen. See how quiet y'all got? Hilarious. I I saw it. (laughs) But you weren't made to be in the background. Well, Pastor Joy, I just got the gift of help stole. So? Oh, so that means that your help's got to be in a janitor's closet somewhere? Like you can't, you can't be seen with your gift of help? How crazy is that? We are all meant to be seen. All of us. Because if we're not seen, the people that need us won't see us. If you're hiding in a closet, if you're hiding in the back somewhere, and there's somebody out there that needs exactly what you have specifically, and nobody out there can give it to them, they'll never get it because you hid. it. My question is, how many of you have people waiting on you? There are people waiting to be delivered. But because you think your testimony is so bad and you don't want nobody to know your secrets, you don't want nobody to know how you overcame, that person's going to stay there struggling. Who are you? Your mediocre voice, you don't think it's really that good, but someone's soul and spirit is waiting on that note that you can sing. But because you don't want to use it because you don't think it's good enough or it doesn't compare to somebody else's, that person's going to have to wait. That's wild. You can't hide what God has given you and think you're going to live abundantly. You can't. 
Remember, they, he made them abundant. They got abundance. And the one that hid it got nothing. And what they had was taken. Are you willing to be one of those people that have nothing? Who are you? That servant, he, it was like this. It was like the master gave him a gift that he should have honored, and he said it's not good enough. And hid it. You ever gave a kid something that you thought was the best gift in the world, and you look up and they didn't threw it somewhere and didn't even respect it? You be like, that's the last time I'm giving you anything. You ain't getting nothing else. because they didn't take care of their gift that you gave them? What if God was that person? <laughs> Can y'all afford to not get anything from God? <laughs> the other thing is this, that, because I have, okay, so this is why it's confusing for me, Okay. It's everywhere, so I'm just looking at arrows. Give me a minute to look at where the arrows are going. All right. <laughs> uh, okay. The other thing is this. They increased what they were given. See, he held on to what he was given, and it was bad for him to do that because he held on to it. So he maintained it. He just didn't use it nowhere. And that was just as bad. It's not doing anything and digging a hole. All, it was super bad that he's like, throw him into the darkness. There's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. It was a whole dramatic exit for him because he didn't increase. Here's your other note today. Your talents start off one way. They will either increase or decrease. They will increase if you work it. They will decrease if you don't use it. So you might have been a kid that was naturally good at, I don't know, artwork. I don't know. Or not artwork, cooking. I don't care. Anything. You're naturally good at it as a kid. Somebody told you that it wasn't good enough. You stopped doing it. Now if you try to pick it back up again, it's going to be very hard to do. Because you ain't did it for so long. Okay? But if you were one of those kids, you see these kids... You know, they, they had these talents, and they just be cultivated. The parents be pushing them, pushing them, pushing them, pushing them to use those talents. And they become these great, amazing people, right? Because they increased it. So not only were they good at it when they were young, but they're even better at it now. So you have to grow in your talents. There is some type of work that you do have to do. And the work is not as hard as you think because, again, it's a natural ability. So now you're just trying to hone your craft, whatever it might be. You understand what I'm saying? See, when I was little, I was always telling somebody what to do. I know that for a fact. To a point where, like, if my parents was kicking it with some friends and they brought all the kids to the house, I'd be in a room with them. I was only nine, but I was telling everybody what to do. They never got a babysitter. They didn't have to because I wasn't about to let nobody wild out at somebody's house. I'm watching them. I'm telling them what to do. I was always telling people what to do. Sometimes it was good things to do. Sometimes it was bad things to do. I'm, I'm telling you. No, no, no. But I was gifted in motivating people to do stuff. That was a gift. Now, I thank God that I honed that craft for good and not evil, because it could have been a lot worse. But... I honed the cra I, I, I worked on that craft. Being bossy is natural to me. I'm bossy. I'm just playing. Stop, stop. <laughs> but I say all that to say this, that you have to get good at it and you have to use it to increase the kingdom. You got you to gotta use it. And so this is a side note, parents. <laughs> Why did you? Okay, God. Some people... <laughs> Dr. J is guilty of this too, but I love her. Some people take their talent and try to give their talent to their kid. 
Everybody like, well, what did Dr. J do? Dr. J is the most amazing artist I've ever known. It, you should see the artwork that we have in our house that she generated. You ain't got to clap. You ain't never seen it. So you can't clap for something you don't know. But trust me, I, you know me, I ain't going to be fake. If she's doing stick figures, I'm not going to tell you she's amazing, okay? She does portraits, landscape stuff. She's really good. Well, she tried to teach me how to draw, okay? I got basics, but I ain't gifted. I ain't got that natural ability, but I can, I learn. And she would enter me into coloring contests and art contests and, you know, all the kids outside playing. And she'd be like, hurry up. You can do it. Finish this up. Finish this up. I was like, but I don't really do this. It's not good. It's just not good. And she really wanted me to be an artist. That wasn't my natural ability. How many of y'all parents have tried to give your kids your talent because you don't want to do it? Now, I ain't saying Dr. J ain't do it because she was doing her talent. I ain't saying that. But how many of y'all have given, trying to make your child good at what you good? How many of y'all make your child play basketball because you was a good basketball player, so they got to be a good basketball player? You know how many NBA players are not even supposed to be on the court because their parents made them that because it's just like, oh, it's in the lineage. No, not necessarily. Because remember, our gifts and talents are specific to us personally. So how you going to give somebody stuff that God gave you? So your side note is this, parents, stop pushing your kids in your stuff. Push yourself in your stuff. See how few claps I got? Because somebody mad. You better not stiff me in this offering either because I didn't call out your business. I ain't got nobody in mind. I don't have nobody in mind. I'm just saying you can't make them good at what God made you good at unless that's something God gave them. Now, it does happen. Don't get me wrong. It does happen where, you know, generationally, there's a talent that, you know, because, like, my mother's side of the family, we're very artistic, very artistic. And actually, some of the Olivers are very musically inclined, okay? But we're artistic. We're in the acting. We're in the drawing. We're in the dancing. We're in the speaking. We're in the singing. It's, it's, it's generationally we all have talents, but it doesn't necessarily mean that we all got the same one. You understand what I'm saying? And so you can't make your child have the same one as you unless God gave them the same one. Cultivate what God gave them. And you do that by cultivating what God gave you. They're going to be motivated to do what they're good at. But if you sitting at home ain't doing nothing but eat, sleep, work, make sure they clean up, cook, and, and that's it for your day, they don't have nothing to strive for. You want to know, okay, God, okay, God. Oh, well, we're here. You want to know why these kids, these young people, are idolizing these celebrities? Because they don't see celebrity at home. They see these people that look like, because most of the time it's not what they're showing, because they can only see what's put in front of them. So they see this show of them grinding and getting all this money and getting all the girls and getting all the guys and they got all the jewelry and the nice cars and the nice houses. They're chasing their dreams. And so they want that. And they want that because you at home ain't chasing nothing. You gave up on yours. And I bet you if you ask some of your teenagers they, if they could speak openly, they would say that. They would say, hey, I don't never see you. You just work all this. Why would they want that life? This generation is different. They're a generation of dreamers. They're a generation of people that want to do great things and think they can. And think that ain't nothing going to stop them. They think they can have whatever they want if they put their mind to it. And every time they come home, y'all just doing whatever. Why do they, why do they want to strive for anything? Or all you telling them is that they got to get good grades so they can get in college so they can be just like you. See how quiet it is? Some of y'all going to be real mad at me. <laughs> and I'm okay with this because I am who I am. I have never pushed anybody to go to college. I've had parents bring them to me. Tell them, tell them. Everybody like, because yeah, we've been indoctrinated that in order to be successful in life, you got to go to college. Now, there are some people that are supposed to go to college. 
But I never tell people you have to go to college. You know what I tell them? What did God tell you to do? You need to pray about what God told you to do. Well, I'm about to go to school for this. Cool. Did God tell you to do that? That's my first response. Some of are irritated with me when I say that. Did God tell you? Well, I mean, I think, uh-uh. Did God tell you to do that? Because I would hate for you to get somewhere and your favor is nowhere near there. Now, your favor might be there. I never tell them not to. I just say, make sure that's where it is. Pastor Joy, I'm about to get in the army. Cool. Is that what God told you to do? I'm not against somebody going to the army if that's where God told them to go because there's some people's purposes and talents that are intertwined in the military. There are people in the military that need God. People in the military need the kingdom of God. So I'm not going to tell somebody not to do that. But what I am going to say is, did God tell you to do that? Or are you just trying to do it so you can get a free ride to college because your parents told you that you had to go to college in order to be successful? See how that... Just a hamster wheel. So for me, if we're going to use talents, I will push a kid to take a dance class before I will push them to sit in their room and study all day on some stuff that really ain't them. Am I saying that they shouldn't get an education? Not at all. Until they hone in on what they're good at, they need to be in school because school is developed not so that, well, now the nation has made it where it's really just about money and stuff like that. But that's not what I wanted to, I want to expound on. What I'm saying is that if you don't know what you're supposed to be doing, school has all of these different subjects and all of these different clubs for children to explore. So I push them to, hey, explore. If somebody comes to me, they're about to graduate from high school, and they have no clue what God told them to do, I tell them to go to college. Why? Because there's so many things you can do. Learn what you can do. Go take some classes. It don't necessarily have to be in a major. Go, go do stuff. Learn what you're good at. Reignite some fires that you had. See how quiet it is? Because these parents is beefing with me. But parents, if you teach your children to depend on God and not man, don't matter what diploma they got. I have watched, I have watched young people do what their parents told them to do, and their lives are okay, but they took a path that they should not have taken. I've watched kids, they wanted to pursue acting, but their parents was like, I ain't paying for that. So they had to pursue something else, like in the medical field or, you know, law enforcement or something like that. And they pursued that, and they're okay at it, but I see how sad they are in their eyes. Because their spirit is grieved. Because they're not doing what God made them to do. And then I watch how their talent gets less and less because they're not using it. I need us to be more focused on what God wants for us and not what the world wants for us. This last piece I'm going to talk about and I'm done. Yep, this is it. Last piece. Exodus 34. And actually, Exodus 25 through 31 talks about how God gave Moses this vision, this dream uh, of what his... Uh, tent of meeting or tabernacle was supposed to look like. He gave him very specific instructions down to the color thread on the priest's clothes. Everything was measured out. He said, now go down there and make it. So Moses goes down and he, now let's be clear, lots of stuff happened in the going down. There was some golden calves happening. It was, some, it, was, it was a lot. But ultimately, they got the vision. Okay. And so they get the vision of what God wanted them to do. And Moses said, okay, I need y'all to bring offerings, bring stuff so that we can do it. So we're going to pick up in um, 35, chapter 35, verse 20, message version. 35 verse 20, message version. So everyone in the community of Israel left the presence of Moses. Then they came back. Every one 
of everyone whose heart was roused, whose spirit was freely responsive, bringing offerings to God for building the tents of meeting, furnishing for worship, furnishing it for worship and making the holy vestments. They came, both men and women, all the willing spirits among them, offering uh, brooches, uh, what else did they offer? A whole bunch of earrings, rings, jewelry. Okay, so they gave all their jewelry, they gave all their good clothes, they gave all their linens, all their sheets off their beds, uh, you know, they leather, they leather boots, they brought them, you know what I'm saying? Uh, dang, dolphin skins, that's rough. A whole dolphin got skin. First of all, how did you catch that dolphin? Second of all, how did you skin them? And what did you do with the meat? Where was this dolphin at? I just know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting sidetracked. But that, can, can, can we discuss just for a second? Where, where did this dolphin come from? Like they was in the desert. So where did the dolphin come from? They were in the desert. Did they jack it from one of the Egyptians? Then I need to ask the Egyptian, where did you get the dolphin? I'm going to move on. But anyway, so they brought wood and all this stuff. They brought everything, okay? Uh, and they brought it at the very end. It says they brought it a voluntary offering for God. So I want to close in this. Moses presented the vision that God gave him to the people and said, this is what God told me to do. Now I need you guys to help me get it done. Those people accepted God's vision, attached themselves to that vision, went home and started gathering all their stuff so that it could get done. As they were hearing the vision, they was like, ooh, I can bring that. I got that at the house. Ooh, I can bring that. I got that at the house. So they was already thinking about what they already had to contribute to the vision. I'm going somewhere. Then in uh, chapter 36, verse 2, he summoned two guys that were skilled in stuff, and along with him, all of these skilled people, these people that knew how to do what needed to be done to make this tabernacle. So not only did they get all the materials they needed for it, they got the people they needed to make it. And they was already with the people that the vision was cast to. See how quiet y'all getting? Because y'all know I'm setting y'all up. It's okay. Now, they gave what they were prompted to give. Moses didn't tell them, you, go to your house and get that gold bowl. You, go to your house and get that uh, blue thread. He didn't tell nobody what to do. They heard from God when they heard the vision, and they went home and did what they heard God tell them to bring. It got to a point where uh, in verse uh, 4 of chapter 36 in the message version, it says they were all working. The artisans are like the artistic people, the people that work with their hands, okay? They were working, making everything involved in construction, the sanctuary. They came one after another to Moses and said, hey, the people are bringing more than enough for doing this work that God has commanded us to do. So Moses sent out orders through the camp and said, men, women, no more offerings for the building of the sanctuary. The people were ordered to stop bringing gifts. There was plenty of material for all the work to be done, enough and more than enough. The Israelites heard the vision that God gave Moses, and they gave towards it. I have given you the vision. I've told you what God told me about what we're supposed to be doing here at EOC. Am I right? I was very specific, was I not? And so I'm telling you these things. Some of you guys heard those things and your spirit jumped on some of those things. But some of y'all didn't act on when your spirit jumped. Some of y'all decided to go home and look at your talent that's in the ground in your backyard. Some of y'all decided that I'm going to just see what everybody else do and then I'm going to just I fill in where I need to fill in. But the fact of the matter is, when I said, when I cast the vision that we were supposed to be giving $5,000 worth of groceries, 
That should have came from in-house. Y'all like, well, Pastor Joy, we give offerings and we give tithes. We sure do. But you got to understand, this is something that we're doing above and beyond what's happening in the regular function of the house. So all of you talking about, they got enough money. No. We, we never have enough money because there's always something that God needs us to do. See how slow that clap was? Because you think I'm trying to get offering out of you. You think, I, you think I'm trying to get your money. This is what I'm telling you. It's so crazy how you will see somebody's GoFundMe and you'll immediately gear towards that. You don't even know if it's real or not sometimes, but you'll give towards that. But when it's time for you to give towards something that you know we're not lying about, like we didn't lie about this. I got several witnesses that will tell you that at each one of those grocery stores, they had $1,000 cash in hand. Each one of them. And they gave, and we have receipts. See, because we ain't trifling like that. We don't just give out money and we can't account for the money that we gave out. We have receipts to account for what we gave. We're very accountable. Dr. C made that what the culture was here. He was very transparent with the money here. We, we ain't got to lie about this money. We ain't got nothing to hide. You understand what I'm saying? We don't have to. I'm not pocketing your cash. Trust me, if we did, I wouldn't be wearing these little bootleg boots that I was talking to my armor bearer about. Y'all like, well, they nice. They bootleg. Trust me. They, almost, they on the level of a gangster lean. Almost, you know the ones that you be walking around and you, they almost there. I know. Don't worry about it. I know who I am. And so I'm saying is this. If I was pocketing your cash, baby, I'd be dripping right now. If I was that person, I'd be jacking all your little money. Okay? But that's not who we are. That's not who Dr. J is. That's not how we get down here. If we say we're going to use money for something, we're going to use it for that. <laughs> and I don't think, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't think it's stingy. I think it's scared. I think it's scared. I think people are afraid to give to a church because they've been so indoctrinated that they might, they might not be doing it now, but eventually they're going to be using this money for something they ain't supposed to be using it for, eventually, because it always happens that way. That's what you letting the devil keep telling you. But again, this ain't even about offering. Let's switch it. I'm leaving offering out of it. There were people that were skilled that started building. They didn't hire construction workers. They didn't hire people to sew the priest's garments. They had that in-house. Why are we here at EOC paying people to repair stuff that we have here at the church when I know we in the house? Why am I paying a plumber? Why? I would rather pay somebody in-house than pay somebody out-house, but ain't nobody told me that what they do. I don't know what y'all do. Why am I paying somebody for graphics outside the house? Why am I paying somebody, wanted to pay somebody for social media? I don't have nobody. Why, why are we paying people to, to do a uh, landscaper? Why are we paying people to shovel snow? Why are we paying people to do this? Because black folks think we always got to get paid for what we do. Because we don't believe that God is going to take care of us. We trust the money and not the one that created the money. I'm done, I promise. All I want you to do, I don't want you to leave out of here feeling like I beat on you and stuff like that because that's not my heart. My heart is to motivate you. My heart is this. I believe that whatever we need to make this a nationwide church that does so much that makes the city of Gary a beacon of light in the nation, we have it in the house. But this means that you need to stop thinking less of what you're good at because one talent is not better than the other. Singing ain't better than cleaning. Being on stage ain't better than being in the kitchen. It's not about that. It's not about status. It's about what God wants you to do. Worry about you. 
focus on you. Stop worried about what somebody next to you doing. I want you to look at your, you know, the, instead of looking at the, the, the speck in their eye, get the plank out of yours. Instead of looking at how somebody else is, forget them. Look at you. Are you doing what God made you to do? Are you using everything that God gave you for his kingdom? Or have you dug a hole? And if you have dug a hole, I need you to get a shovel, dig that stuff back up, and start asking God for mercy. I need you to start repenting. God, I repent. I'm sorry that I despised your gift. I'm sorry that you gave me this talent and I put it to the side because I thought I wasn't good enough at it. I apologize, God. I am now changing my thinking. I want to use what you gave me, God. Show me what I'm supposed to be doing. How am I supposed to use this for your kingdom? And I promise you, when you do that, God is going to not only say, well done, but he's going to add to you.